Okay. So I good morning everybody. Um, I'm just about to leave the floor to Caterina for the official introduction to our our guest today, um, Professor Gera Gabrielse. I just wanted to uh, remind you that uh, the subject of, uh, of this talk is very much in line with the uh, Departamento Eccellenza, the funding that we got from the ministry, uh, which essentially aims at uh, uh, empowering that line of research um, and will indeed uh, will span the next five years uh, with funding for hiring and, uh, and research. So uh, indeed that's uh, an additional reason uh, if that were needed to enjoy the, the seminar. So Caterina, please. Honored to have uh, Professor Gerald Gabrielse with us, and uh, I have a short view for introducing to you. So, Professor Gabrielse is the Board of Trustees, Professor of Physics, and Director for the Center of Fundamental Physics at the Northwestern University. It is the first center of its kind to be dedicated to small-scale tabletop experiments in fundamental physics. So he is a George Leverett Professor of Physics at Harvard University, where he chaired the physics and, uh, um, department for many years. He's a member of the National Academy of Science, a fellow of the American Physical Society, and a member of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's won numerous awards uh, from scientific societies. Let me just mention the Levinson Prize for Excellence in Education of Undergraduates, Harvard University, which holds well for our enjoyment of today's lecture. He pioneered and continued for many years experiments uh, in the field of uh, low energy antiproton and high-entry hydrogen, leading a team at CERN. His work has paved the way to incredibly precise measurements with fundamental particles and the study of antimatter, testing fundamental laws of physics like CPT invariance. So as part of the academic collaboration at Harvard, measured the electron electric dipole moment using a molecular beam, a result which had implications for the viability of supersymmetry. So for today's lectures, he will talk about the most precise measurements of the electron magnetic moment performed in this group by using a single trapped electron. These are the most precise measurements of any single particle and are among the most stringent tests of the standard model. So I'll leave the floor to you and welcome uh, Professor Gerard Gabrielson. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, It's amazing to hear these introductions about your accomplishments. It makes me feel very old, okay? It just means you've me lived a long time. So um, it's great to be here. It's an honor. I mean, to be where Galileo once served is almost uh, impossible to, to, to fathom. So I really came here to see all the little Galileos in training here. So there's a presumably lots of them. So if any of you like this sort of physics and you don't want to work for this new initiative, come to Northwestern University, okay? And, uh, and we'll, 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 we'll welcome you there. Okay, down to the business at hand. I'm going to try and tell you mostly about a new measurement of the electron magnetic moment. And I'll do a little bit of a side trip uh, which uh, uh, on, on, on a, dark, a dark photon limit that we set uh, as we were doing this. And uh, the scale of our apparatus you can see here, um, there's me. I'm the only guy in the group who doesn't, who is useless, right? I just sort of, I'm the cheerleader. This is the guy, uh, Xing Fan, who did his, his PhD thesis work. These are the two students, Benedict and Tom, who are, uh, working on the next generation experiment. And our apparatus is down in this hole in the ground. 
So we do tabletop physics, but we sink our table down into a hole, and that's for good reason. Else, uh, when we walk by the magnet, our credit cards get erased, okay? And so by having it down in the hole, that doesn't happen. Plus, we can take a long, skinny apparatus and, and, and pull it out of, of, the, of the trap. So this is the scale of physics that we do. All right, now the reports on these measurements, if, you, if this catch your fancy and you wanna look at it some more, uh, they've both been published recently in physical review letters and you can just look it up, uh, find it by, by my name or whatever. And there's also an interesting article, the APS, the American Physical Society, announced this new measurement and they had a, a fairly nice uh, popular article. There's also for students, Wired Magazine, which you've maybe heard of, they just had an article about it as well, which is more at a, a popular level. Okay, so the motivations. Well, the, the standard model uh, is, is a great triumph of modern physics. For those who don't know the standard model, it's a collection of particles, okay, and there's too many, it seems, but this is what, what, what nature seems to give us. And it's some interactions between those particles, strong interactions, weak interactions, electromagnetic interactions, gravitational interactions. And then there's a bunch of letters, okay? And these letters stand for symmetries of the model, okay? Uh, so parity is the one you've heard of most likely, okay? And time reversal is the one that really makes the general public get tied in knots. I was on a, a national radio show talking about this one time with a theorist, and the theorist started talking about time reversal and clocks running backwards, whereupon the phones just lit up, okay? Where could we see these clocks that are running backwards, you know? And the experimenters, me and another guy were trying, no, no, it's not, that's not quite what it means, okay? But that's time reversal, okay? And charge conjugation is the operator where you change uh, uh, particles into antiparticles. And miraculously, I think, in the standard model, or so it seems to me, even though none of these is a good symmetry invariance, the combination of all three together is. Okay, now that's, that's, that's really kind of remarkable. All right, and then the whole structure is held together with a, a, a mathematical framework called quantum field theory. Okay, and most of us don't study quantum field theory till we're graduate students, okay, because it's quite mathematical. And then there's, there's, uh, there's various other properties I won't mention. But this is the, the most, uh, you know, the most general, the most basic, the most mathematical description of physical reality that we have. And it's called the standard model for short. It's not a great creative name, okay, but such, such it is. Now, that's the great, the great triumph is that the standard model is able to predict essentially everything that we have been able to measure in the laboratories. Okay, that's a pretty strong statement. The frustration is that the standard model is wrong. Okay, and, and, and why is it wrong? Well, it's at least incomplete. I mean, a lot of it has to be right, of course, but there's something big missing and we can't put our fingers on it because it can't really explain the basic features of the universe. For example, according to the standard model, when the Big Bang happened, there should be essentially equal amounts of matter and antimatter created. As the universe cools, the matter runs into the antimatter, it annihilates, it disappears, and yet there's an experiment. We have a universe left over, right? So it's a loophole in the standard model that you can drive a universe through, right? I mean, it's a pretty, pretty big problem. Th there's other things. We, we, can't, uh, we can't explain inflation. We can't explain dark energy. Uh, we don't know what dark matter is, though we know it's there. So there's good news for the young people in the audience. I mean, my generation has real, really failed to explain most of the physical universe. Okay, so there's plenty of things that you can do that are really important left. All right, so the standard model is at one time the great triumph and the great frustration of modern physics. Now, 
we founded the Center for Fundamental Physics to, to look, uh, to, to, look uh, to, to see if we can probe what's going on, you know, what, what's wrong with the standard model. And, and, and with tabletop experiments, you can do it in several different ways. You can test the most precise predictions of the standard model, okay? So you say, all right, standard model, what number do you produce for this? And then you, and then you, and then you check it experimentally. Okay, you can measure where the standard model and the beyond the standard model uh, descriptions disagree. Okay, because not surprisingly, people are trying to make better models than this standard model description, which, you know, don't have these problems with the universe, okay? And, uh, and in some cases, the standard model and these new models make very different predictions. Our ACME electron electric dipole moment measurements okay, are in that category, okay? Because the standard model says that electric dipole moment should be so tiny you're never gonna be able to measure it. Uh, and almost all the, the proposed uh, improvements to the standard model predict a much better, a bigger size of the electron electric dipole moment. So then we sit there and we look, okay? Because in the end, as T.D. Lee, a famous theorist once said, uh, a, a theorists without experiment float away like hot air balloons untethered, okay? I heard him say that, okay, so it, I know it's true. All right, now we can also test the symmetries of the standard model. We can also search for new particles and forces, and I'll give you some examples of those in this talk today. Um, so the basic idea of doing this is instead of going to big and important facilities like CERN, Okay, we take a different approach. Instead of having a lot of energy and blowing things apart and seeing what's inside, we make very precise measurements, okay, so that we can, we sort of substitute precision for energy, if you will, as, as our probe into the uh, innards of, of reality. So we want to probe simple systems that we can understand. We can detect with high sensitivity, and we're looking for hints of what's wrong or what's missing. Okay, so this is low energy particle physics, and for those of you who don't know so much about particle physics, uh, the LHC has energies up here in the tens of TeV, okay? And, uh, and each of these orders of magnitude, on each of these tick marks on this thermometer is an order of magnitude in energy, okay? So there's lots of tick marks. I mean, that's one of the, the remarkable things about our universe is, you know, the range of sizes, the range of energies in the universe is almost impossible to comprehend as a human being. And even the energies that we humans encounter, you know, go from the, the very hot, at, at the, the very high energy at CERN down to cryogenic experiments, and that's where we do the operation, where, where we actually use temperature units to describe um, uh, our experiment. So for example, the experiment I'll tell you about today was largely done at 30 millikelvin. So only 30 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. Now some of you uh, here at, at the INFN lab, I've seen it, have dilution refrigerators and stuff which operate there. It's a kind of standard technology, but it's a big difference in, in, in energy. So we're trying to do particle physics down in this range. Okay, so let's talk about the electron and positron moments. All right, so there are two moments that you can easily confuse and I want to make sure you don't. Uh, I, my group is actually involved in measuring both. I'm going to talk today about the magnetic dipole moment. Okay, so every electron, because it, it moves in empty space, and empty space isn't empty, okay, it acts like a small magnet. Okay, and basically what I'm going to tell you about is measuring the electron's magnet today. Uh, now, you know, you all know about what magnets are. There's a north, sol north pole and a south pole, right? And then there's this funny thing that if you crack the magnet in half, you get two magnets. You don't just, you don't ever get the north pole, right? And, and so, in fact, we, we've looked hard and haven't been able to find any magnetic charges. Okay, so even though this is kind of like a positive and a negative magnetic charge, we can't find any, so far we haven't found any evidence of an isolated magnetic charge. But not to worry, you can still make a magnet by having a current. 
Okay, and so if you have a current loop, and most of you have studied that, the current loop makes a magnetic field. And in fact, it's current loops in the material of this magnet that actually give you the magnetism, okay? So that it, it's all consistent. So this, this, this is what I'll talk about today. Just to mention it, the electric dipole moment, uh, uh, you know, is also a thing. An electric dipole is if you have a plus charge and a minus charge, or you can make an electric dipole moment if you have a big negative charge, because the electron's negatively charged, and a little lump of charge on one side. Okay, we measure so sensitively that that's more the situation that we're probing for. Okay, and, and so that's the electric dipole moment. Now, the magnetic dipole moment and the electric dipole moment are both proportional to the spin vector. For those of you who don't know the wigner eckhart theorem, if, you're sim if your system is simple enough, all the vectors, all the vector operators are proportional to each other, at least their average values are. Okay, and so the magnetic moment has to point along the spin if, 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 if the system is just characterized by one spin. Now, of course, that wouldn't work so well for a molecule because a molecule has all sorts of stuff hanging all different directions, and so there's many, uh, there, there's many angular momenta involved, but this has to be a simple system. Okay. Now, the natural scale for the electron magnetic dipole moment, and this will be my most uh, mathematical slide, I think, um, if we have the natural scale, we can see for circular motion. So if we have circular motion of a charge E, a mass M, at an angular frequency omega, so here's the particle going round and round, okay, then, then, then we can, its angular momentum is the mass times the angular frequency times the radius squared, and H, the, the, we, we set in, we say if it's quantum mechanical, we might expect that the, the unit of angular momentum is H bar, okay? And so that gives us a, a, a basic scale. And the magnetic moment then is, is the current times the area, and if we have one particle going round and round, the current is simple to compute even in public. It's the charge, E, divided by the time it takes to go once around the loop. Okay, and if you massage that a bit, you can see that this combination of constants can be written as the electron charge times the angular momentum divided by 2m. All right, so this is, uh, basically we've made an argument that by dimensional analysis almost, a little more than dimensional analysis perhaps, this is the natural size of an electron magnetic moment. And that's, uh, that's called the Bohr magneton, because it, it pops up so many times in physics. So what we actually measure is the proportionality constant between the magnetic moment and the spin. But we do this after we normalize the spin to h bar over 2, because we say it's a spin 1 half particle. And then we divide this by the Bohr radius, uh, the Bohr magnetron, because the Bohr magnetron is the natural unit of magnetic moments for this system. Okay, so that's what we measure. Now, here's the standard model's uh, most precise prediction, okay? Uh, and, and, and you can see it all, and it either looks complicated and awful or elegant and wonderful, depending on your point of view. But here's the magnetic moment in Bohr magnetons for the electron. There's a term that comes just from the Dirac equation. That's most of the magnetic moment. And then there's a whole series of terms Okay, that come from the inter interaction of the electron with, uh, well, with matter and with empty space, I should say. This is from quantum electrodynamics. And then there's hadronic terms and there's weak interaction terms. Now, these terms that have this alpha in it, alpha is the fine structure constant. It's about 1 over 137. Okay, and Feynman famously said every theorist should put 137 on his or her office wall. Okay, just to keep them humble, because none of us has any idea how to calculate the size of the fine structure constant. Okay, it's just one of these things that we have to measure, so we call it a fundamental constant. In terms of other fundamental constant, it's, it's, it's written in this way. And nowadays, in the modern SI system of units, the electron charge is defined, and h-bar is defined, c has been defined for some time, so we're really measuring epsilon naught if you measure the fine structure constant. It's equivalent. Okay. Now, the, 
if you look at the structure of this, if I want to test the standard model prediction, I, I, I have to calculate this, this, one. Well, even I know how to calculate it, OK? And then someone smarter than me has to calculate all of these coefficients in this series. Now, since alpha is 1 over 137, if you divide by pi, that's a couple hundred. So, so basically, this series should converge pretty convincingly. OK, except that maybe it's an asymptotic series and it's going to blow up eventually, but we won't talk about that because that makes us feel kind of uncomfortable, OK? Um, but anyway, so in order to test the standard model, what you have to do is you have to have a measurement of the fine structure constant and a measurement of the magnetic moment in Bohr magnetons, and then you can see if it's consistent. The theory is actually a bridge between the two. Now, you can't plot things you know, uh, in a, in a multi-dimensional space right, and, and actually visualize it. And so what's historically been done is alpha is considered an input to the theory okay, and then predicts the magnetic moment. But that's a matter of taste. You, know, you can do that uh, as you wish. Okay, now um, this, this uh, the Dirac term I said is easy. You have to calculate Feynman diagrams, okay, uh, in order to, to get these, these various C coefficients. Now, uh, you're very lucky here. We have a celebrity in our midst, and you don't even know, but he calculated this coefficient to an arbitrary precision, right? I mean, just to show off, I think he published 110 digits in his paper. And if you speak nice to him, I think he can give you a, a list of 500 or whatever. Can you stand up, uh, Laporta? Uh, this guy is really a hero of modern physics. I mean, you don't know it, but he just sits quietly. I mean, nobody, in fact, I had a, I had a, quantum, a, a quantum electrodynamics professor at the University of Chicago who assured our class that this coefficient could never possibly be calculated in any way. OK? OK, he was famous. He wrote a couple of books. You know, he was a head of Argonne National Laboratory for a while. And this guy calculated it, not only calculated it, but did it analytically. So thanks. I just wanted to recognize you. OK, and then Kinoshita, who d d uh, died a few days ago, OK, unfortunately. Uh, but he calculated, well, he, he, he really was a driver, a theoretical driver for many of these terms, okay, and did analytic calculations. But he calculated, he and, and Neo at, at Riken, they had to calculate 12,000 Feynman diagrams in order to get this coefficient, okay? And this isn't a trivial exercise. You can't compare a theory and experiment unless you really do this. Uh, these, these folks don't get the credit that they richly deserve. And then there's hadronic and there's weak interaction terms, which at the level of, of accuracy that we measure have to be taken into account. Now, our, our measurement uh, and, and the standard model, uh, we made our first measurement uh, back in, in 2008, OK? And, and since then, you know, it, there's been good agreement between the standard model and, 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 uh, and what we measured until recently, as I'll, I'll tell you, OK? But when we measured it, the measurements of the fine structure constant were 20 times less accurate here. So for many years, the, the tables that you see in the front of your book, or, or the alpha came from our measurement, OK? our measurement of this, assuming that the standard model theory was right, and that's how the fine structure constant came out. And then that, that changed uh, a few years ago, okay? And, and in 2018, there was a new measurement of the fine structure constant, and then the theorists you know, wax poetic writing papers about the difference between our measurement and the, the prediction made with the new fine structure constant. And I know it's only 2.5 standard deviations. So at one conference, I said, 2.5 sigma, you know, you guys better be careful. You know, that there's a statistical distribution. And one of the theorists got up and said, Jerry, you shouldn't try and stop us from having our fun. And so I just shut up about that after that, OK? But there was a lot of uh, interest in that. And a lot of pa papers came out. I just have some of them. Every time I talk, someone tells me I missed their paper. And if I missed yours, I'm sorry, OK, because there's a bunch. OK? And then in 2020, the situation got worse, OK? Because here's, again, our measurement. Here, here is the, the measurement that disagreed. 
And now in a, on a different continent, someone measured it, the fine structure constant, and got a different value. And it's a little embarrassing to experimenters when you know, your values uh, disagree by five standard deviations, right? I mean, and so that's a serious problem right now. And uh, both groups are, are busy working on that and trying to, to fix it and find out what they did wrong, and we'll see what happens. Now, I should say, I'm not worried that they won't sort it out, okay? I think they have high motivation to do that, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens then. But right now, our measurement is accurate enough that once this mess gets cleaned up, we could actually test the standard model, not at the part and 10 to the 12, but almost the part and 10 to the 13 level. Which, is, if you think about it, a part and 10 to the 13, we should be really proud of a, 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 of a standard model theory that can predict something uh, like that, okay? Um, one of the, the founders of quantum electrodynamics wrote me a nice note after we did our measurement and said, uh, this was Freeman Dyson, he said, I can't believe that you can measure it this accurately. He said, when we invented quantum electrodynamics, we never dreamed it could make predictions this way. We thought it was just kludged together and someone would come along with a better theory in the near future. So that's, uh, uh, okay. So a better, magnetic, a better measurement of the magnetic moment was, was, was needed here, okay? Not because that's gonna resolve these two things, but just to sort of encourage people to get their act together. Okay, and, and because I think it, it, it's ripe for better measurements than this, because eventually they'll get their act together, they'll figure out the systematics, and we'll be down to this size, size error bar. So we decided to measure it again. So how do you measure a magnetic moment to 1.3 parts in 10 to the 13, okay? I mean, just, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing, right? So as in all good teaching, I think I'm gonna try and cheat you honestly. Okay, meaning I'm not gonna be dishonest about how we do it, but there'll be a lot of details that I have to sweep under the rug, okay? So here's the basic idea. If you take a magnetic field, here's the magnetic field, and you see a particle going around and round uh, at 150 gigahertz, uh, if it's an electron in a six Tesla field. All right, so that's a cyclotron. That's the principle on which all big circular accelerators are made, right? It's just that the magnet's too expensive, so they cut a hole in the middle, and then they call it a synchrotron. You know, there's some details here about ramping things up. Okay, the cyclotron motion, uh, it, it, well, the, this electron would just go along the magnetic field and would leave. So we put negative charges above and below. So the particle goes up and says, hmm, I see negative charges, I'm negative, I don't like that, and it goes back the other direction. That's called a pinning trap, okay? A pinning trap is just a magnetic field and an electric restoring force, electrostatic restoring force. Okay, now here's a real pinning trap, well, a real one, it's a cutaway picture of a real pinning trap, okay? This is the one that we use, it's, it's of order a half centimeter across this dimension. Okay, the electron sits inside, but to be honest, I had to expand it a little so you could see it, right? Uh, in fact, we think the electron has no size, so I expanded it quite a lot, okay? But that's where it is. And then there's various electrodes here. And the important thing is that we can apply the negative charges above and below, but we actually carefully shape the potential to be an electrostatic quadrupole and that's so we have a z squared potential. If this is the z axis, then the particle will move up and down in this motion between these charges as a harmonic oscillation. And that's our detector motion, okay? So that's, we measure the frequency of that motion to learn about the spin and the cyclotron uh, motion that I'll talk about in a moment. Now in this device, we can store particle, uh, a particle for months. I mean, many years ago, I stored one for 10 months, and then one of, one of my associates made a mistake and clicked the frequency synthesizer one click the wrong way, okay, and instead of cooling the particle, it drove it out, and we were gonna have a birthday party for it, and we were gonna invite the New York Times and stuff like this, and then we lost the electron. So what can I say? Uh, stuff happens is the saying we have. All right, so now, this isn't exactly what we do because the other thing we do is instead of having this big cyclotron motion, we cool the motion so much that we start to see the quantum structure, well, in fact, we completely see the quantum structure in the cyclotron motion, okay? And I'll show you evidence that we're mostly in the ground state, okay? Unless we specifically 
make it excite. Okay, and, and, and uh, so basically in order to do that, we need to get thermal equilibrium, and you could scratch your head a little bit and think, what is thermal equilibrium for one particle, right? That's a good homework exercise in a class, right? Maybe even for some professors, but all right. But the thermal equilibrium for one particle, and, and, and then, then we'll stay in this ground state. So in order to do that, we have to have this energy spacing be very much greater than KT. And that energy spacing in temperature units is 7.2 Kelvin. So we have to go to a temperature well below 7.2 Kelvin in order to do this. And then we get these boring states that don't oscillate, right? Uh, quantum mechanics students always should ask more questions, I think, about why the oscillators they learn about in their quantum courses never oscillate, right? They just stay in stationary states. So here's what this state looks like. It's just a distribution Okay, uh, 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 an axially symmetric distribution of charge. And then when we go up to the first excited state, also nothing is moving, but we have a distri different distribution of charge. So those are the two states that we use. And, uh, and, and basically, the, the way we get the, the, the quantity that we need is we say, well, there's going to be, well, I have to tell you a little bit more. There's the infinite number of cyclotron states that I've already talked about, but also I can have spin down or spin up, right? So I have a different ladder of cyclotron states for each of those. And we work with these lowest three uh, quantum states. These two states, this one is absolutely stable. It's a stable ground state. This one is stable for years, so we can consider it uh, as, a, as a stable state. Okay, and, and then we make transitions. Uh, we, we, we drive this transition, this would be a spin flip. We drive this transition, this would be a cyclotron, a cyclotron excitation, pardon me. Okay, and, 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 and then we take the, the ratio of these two frequencies and the ratio of those two frequencies is just what we want, okay? Now, that's great, okay? Because there's nothing we can measure in physics more accurately than a frequency, except a ratio of two frequencies, right? Because then the clock doesn't have to be stable even, you know, you know because if you use the same clock, you're all right, okay? And now if we, if we do the, the old trick and we actually measure this transition, and this transition, then we get some accuracy in our measurement for free, and so we measure the ratio of these two frequencies. Okay, that's the basic idea of the measurement. All right. All right, now there, there's other stuff going on here, and I, again, this is just for honesty's sake. These levels aren't actually equally spaced as you learn about it in undergraduate quantum mechanics, okay? There's a relativistic effect, right? And relativity isn't so big, it's not such a big effect here. For us, it's a part in 10 to the nine per energy level is the difference. And so most people would, most people in physics, in fact, say a part in 10 to the nine, that's negligible, right? But that's a big effect for us, okay? It's huge, it's enough so that we can, we can clearly resolve these different transitions. All right, and, and so, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on this because this is not really a correction. We, we can measure exactly what this constant is, and so there's no uncertainty added by having that there. Okay, so here's how the pinning trap works. I've, I've sort of described already this up and down motion along the, along the magnetic field direction, uh, but there's also gonna be cyclotron motion, except we're gonna go to the boring quantum cyclotron motion where nothing's going in a circle. And then there's a, a big magnetron drift motion uh, named after the magnetron, the sort of device that powers your magnetron oven, okay, your, 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 your microwave oven, okay? But it's, it, for those of you who know about these things, it's an E cross B drift motion, right? If you have an, an electric field and a magnetic field that are perpendicular, then there is one velocity at which there'll be no force, right? E, E plus 
uh, uh, sorry, QE plus QV cross B, those two will just cancel each other at one velocity. And that's what's happening along this, along this direction. And then there's some more reality, but we have this nice theorem that takes that away, but I won't go into those details, okay? But just to give you uh, the answer, in the end, we have to measure something a little more complicated than the ratio of two frequencies, but it's largely the ratio of two frequencies with really tiny and measurable corrections. And that's how we do the measurement. Okay, so here's the scale of the apparatus that we use. So this is, this is something that's, uh, well, I, I'm about this tall, okay? And, and to give you the size, and then inside is a dilution refrigerator, and all the action happens down here in this little can. It's completely sealed. And, and so we have a vacuum. We have a vacuum in here which we claim we've measured to be better than 10 times minus 17 tor. We did that years ago with, uh, with antiprotons. We put antiprotons in, in there and just held it for months to see how long, how, how quickly they would annihilate. That was our vacuum gauge. And here's a picture of the trap electrodes. And again, this is a, this is a five centimeter piece, okay? And, uh, so we, we have to choose our materials carefully. We also, uh, when, the, when, the, when the subway or a garbage truck comes by, it changes the magnetic field in our lab. So we've invented something which is now in all MRI imaging machines whereby the flux conservation that you get inside of a superconducting loop turns into field conservation. Um, and so there's a lot, we had to have a dilution refrigerator that's not rigid like everybody knows they should be, but ours dangles at the bottom, okay? And the reason is so that when we set it down, our trap with the, you know, with the particle inside will sit right on the, on the form that makes the magnetic field, right? It will sit right on the coil. Because else if we, if we suspend it as we used to from two different supports, then atmospheric pressure will change in the room and the, the temperature will change in the room and these two supports will change a little bit and the magnetic field will be different even though it's, it's a really homogeneous field. Okay, again, I'm just trying to give you some details, okay, to, to measure and tune up the magnetic field we have 10 or 12 shim coils and we use a gas helium-3 NMR probe in case some of you uh, experienced researchers are interested in that because we, we do it at a, we, we want to measure the magnetic field at a low temperature and all the conventional NMR sources just freeze and their line width gets really broad. And our trick there is to take a tiny glass ball that has uh, helium-3 in it and if we put enough pressure of helium in there so that we can see it, Okay, then, and, and it's all right when we're cold because, you know, the, the ideal gas law says if I'm cold, I'm not going to take so much volume. Okay, but then when we take it out to, to work on it, it will blow up. So what we do is we could take a, a capillary to a big, a big uh, uh, container, okay, and then the helium all comes up from our little glass ball. But again, I'm just trying to give you some, some, some feel for how this goes. Okay, now the, to, to monitor things, um, Basically, we monitor the axial uh, oscillation in the, in, in, in the vertical direction. We can measure tiny changes in this frequency, and here's an example of what we see. So this is energy in the cyclotron motion, okay, versus, um, versus time. And, and so what you can see is that we're mostly in the ground state. We occasionally jump up to the first excited state and occasionally to the second excited state. Now, what's causing these transitions? In this case, it's black body photons. So for example, let's take this one, which is clean. A black body photon comes in, and our, our, our artificial atom, our bound system, electron bound to our apparatus, absorbs a cyclotron photon. It stays excited for a while, and then it decays, all right? And, and that decay is either from a stimulated emission from the black body photon or a spontaneous emission. And now as we lower the temperature, then, then, then we get less and less black body photons. So at 1.6 Kelvin, we get about one per hour. And then the decay is almost certainly a, a spontaneous emission, okay? Because it's unlikely that another black body photon would have come in to make it happen. And then when we get down to the temperatures we operate at, we never see any transitions at all. So we have the ground state with essentially perfect fidelity. Um, 
All right, now, you notice that on a long scale, this is a thermal state. On a short scale, it, it, it's one quantum state or the other, okay? And so in order to have quantum mechanics describe this, you have to take many hours and average it together, okay? Because quantum mechanics doesn't do a very good job at describing individual particles and how they behave, right? It's only, it's only ensemble averages. All right, uh, we use quantum non-demolition detection. Uh, you know, here's, here's, here's what happens though. We measure the number of quantum jumps, the number of quantum jumps as a function of the drive frequency on each of these two transitions that I was highlighting before, okay? And we get a line shape. As we change the frequency, we see that we get more quantum jumps or less quantum jumps. So this is spectroscopy at its most primitive. And, and here, this is for the cyclotron transition, this is for the anomaly transition. And uh, one of the things that we're struggling with is this one, they should be the same width fractionally, because this is on the same fractional scale. And this one is broader than this one, and that's because they average the fluctuations in the magnetic field differently. Okay, and so we're trying to take some steps to change that. Okay, we inhibit spontaneous emission. Okay, and uh, we do that by having this microwave cavity, uh, you know, arranging that we're between two resonant modes of the microwave cavity. Okay, and, and, and when we're between, the particle looks out and says, boy, I'd really like to radiate today, but there's no density of states there to do so. Okay, and the result is that it, it inhibits the spontaneous emission. And that's essential. That gives us the averaging time we need to see the quantum state of the particle. Okay, and, uh, but it also adds some systematic effects because if you have a cyclotron oscillator and you have a cavity mode oscillator, you probably all know that coupled oscillators pull each other's frequencies. And since we're trying to measure the frequency of this, we have to be very careful that we uh, understand that correctly. Okay, and I won't have time to talk about the details of that, but here's at least a, 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 a representation. This is a number of measurements that we made at, at, at different values of the magnetic field, so different values of the cyclotron frequency. And, and then we, we were able to, to uh, learn enough about the, ca the cavity mode spectrum, this is what we measured here, and, and measured enough so that we can correct the shifts that we have from it, and then all the measurements uh, basically come into agreement. Um, so here's our, our, our uncertainty table. I won't go through the details, okay? But then, then we get this result, which I've already, uh, already told you about, okay? All right, so uh, I think I, I probably should wind up there, but let me, just, uh, let me just mention one thing. I'll just say it in words. Um, if a, if, if, if a dark photon goes through, okay, this is, a, you know, this is a particle that we would like to find, okay, to extend the, the, the standard model. If a dark photon comes through, it will be mixed with a regular photon because we don't know any principle that prevents that. And so we can then detect the regular part of the, the regular photon part of the dark photon, uh, uh, you know, mixture, shall we say, or, or superposition. And, 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 and what this, if we have a, a, a cyclotron motion in its ground state, then we can, at that frequency, we can say, well, if a dark photon comes through, it's going to create a regular photon, which is going to excite our particle. And we can sit there and look. So this is a sort of, it's a very new approach to, to dark matter detection. And there's a, a paper in Physical Review Letters in December that you can look at if you want. But basically, we sat there for two days and looked and didn't see any transitions. And every couple of hours, we drove transitions deliberately by putting photons in the cavity to make sure our system was working. And, and that way, we were able to establish a new limit, which was uh, 75 times lower than what we had before. I don't see the picture right now, but it's not so important. Now, that really wasn't a dark photon search yet, because we only looked at one frequency. Right, and we should extend it. We have to make a purpose-built apparatus that can, be, that can sweep. The, the apparatus I've been telling you about was, of course, designed to be stable and have the magnetic field never change, and now we need to sweep over a broad range. But I think we could cover probably 10 gigahertz to uh, maybe 200 megahertz. So that's right in the milli-electron volt range where it's very hard to get sensitive detection. 
Okay, so uh, we have a whole new apparatus going up, and we're, I, I'm, very, I'm very hopeful that we're going to, uh, in the end, have a, have a, um, uh, a, a measurement in the next few years even that might be as much as 10 times more accurate than the one I told you about today. So that's kind of exciting. And, and what we're going to do there is use some new quantum tricks, okay, and we're going to use a quantum limited detector. Those are the, and then one other thing, we're going to try and design a cavity with less, uh, with a higher Q, which is something that we can learn from Katerina and some others who are here. So uh, the new magnetic moment, that this measurement is a first step. We think in the next few years, we're also going to be able to improve by a factor of 200 the lepton CPT test made by comparing the magnetic moment of an electron and a positron, okay? And, uh, and the new apparatus is just starting to operate as we speak. It's taking too much helium yet, but we hope that it soon will be, uh, we'll figure out what the story is on that. And then the dark photon experiment, I think we can do a broader range and we're considering whether we, sh we should do that. But the moral of the story is we're still having fun doing uh, fundamental physics on a tabletop, okay, and, and maybe having a little bit of impact. And you know, physics is a privileged profession, it's an honor to do it, and it's an honor to tell you about it in this uh, historical place. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Gaviese. There are, there is time for questions. Um, excuse me, um, concerning uh, your, um, uh, your bound uh, on the dark photon, uh, the, this depends uh, on the um, uh, amount of mixing uh, with ordinary photon that uh, you assume, uh, I guess. Yes, of course, right? okay. And so usually these exclusion plots are usually made like this. I mean, here, here's an example. This, this is the mass that you'd yes. look for, and this is that coupling. Yeah. Uh, that the superposition factor. I see, I yeah. see. Okay, and uh, yeah, and this is just on a broader range. On a so broad it is uh, the red, uh, red area there. Well, th you know, we drew this as an area, but if you put it uh, on a, a sort of a, a big scale, uh, it looks yes. like our measurement was just a spike, because in some sense we really didn't do a search. It was a demonstration I of a see. new so, method. So you selected the yeah. just... Uh, right, okay. Uh, okay. And, and, you know, we, we, could, we, could, we could cover a much broader range, but we have to build an entirely new apparatus to do that. I mean, right now we couldn't even afford the liquid helium cost to sweep the existing system to do such a measurement because we're not at, you know, IFN, INFN, and where they have, you know, three helium uh, reliquifiers. We have none, okay? And so it costs a lot of money, okay, to do it. And, and this you can use only for uh, searching for particles mixing with uh, the photon, and say, this uh, technique. Yeah, that's right. Well, in, in, uh, or you could search in principle for an axion, because in the high magnetic field, the axion would convert to a photon. Uh, yes. uh, and I was really excited about that uh, when the axion was first postulated, but I didn't do it so far because the, um, the, the, mag the photon created is polarized along the magnetic field. That's exactly the wrong, uh, you know, polarization to excite the cyclotron motion. So we could do a, a, a more complicated experiment where we would let the axion convert in one area and then, you know, change the directions a bit so that we could get some sensitivity to that field. But that, again, it involves a, a very substantial apparatus change, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, can hardly probe the existence of this hypothetical particle. Right. This is yeah. this is this is right. This is this this measurement was made. That's why it's sort of interesting. It's in a gap, you know, where where people haven't been able to come up with sensitive ways to probe for the dark photon in this case, but for most most any particle, uh, you know, in this range. So that's why it's kind of an exciting uh, prospect. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you mentioned uh, that you can uh, probe uh, over a much broader range uh, the existence yeah, of this I, I, candidate. I, I, I believe, by I believe, changing I believe the that we can cover a broader range, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much by broader. changing the, the, the magnetic field, I was, uh, do you expect to have the same sensitivity across the whole interval? Is there some with, parameter with that comes into play? With the improvements that we can imagine making right now, we think we could get a comparable sensitivity over a range roughly from 1020 gigahertz up to 200 gigahertz. Okay. Uh, curiosity. I mean, you aim to increase precision. Uh, there is some key strategy or key technical advance that allow you for this, or it's only, I mean, there is some I, very I, new idea, very new technique or? Let me say a general statement. If you make the kinds of improvements that we've made in ACME in our EDM or in this experiment, you know, which tend to be orders of magnitude, this last one was smaller, okay, you can't do that just by polishing the apparatus harder. You have to have new ideas, okay? And the new ideas for the new uh, magnetic moment measurement are, 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 are the three I just mentioned, but too fast, okay? One is we want to use quantum tricks whereby even though the detector motion is in about 10 quantum states, we can make it so that we're sensitive only during the time that the detector motion is in its lowest quantum state. Okay, we call that uh, back action circumvention. We still have zero point motion, okay, but that's, that's a big thing, that's one thing. The other thing is we want to read out this detector motion using a quantum limited detector, starting with a squid for, for starters, okay? And, and because the squid will be operating in our frequency range a couple hundred megahertz, almost in its quantum limited regime, we'll have much less heat, you know, much less uh, excitation of the particle that comes from the detector, okay? And then the third thing uh, is that in order to succeed, we need to make a, a lower loss trap cavity. You know, this trap uh, it, th that inhibits spontaneous emission, we need to inhibit spontaneous emission more because the line width, even of the 200 times inhibited um, spontaneous emission is now of the order of our uncertainty. And so to go another order of magnitude, we have to do that as well. So those are the three new ideas. Is that, is that what you were asking about? Yeah, and if you don't have new ideas, number one, it's not fun to do these measurements, okay? And number two, it doesn't work, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No student questions? Yes, yeah, shy. <gasps> Don't be shy. The guy in the white shirt has been almost asking a question, right? You want to ans ask a question, right? <laughs> Obviously not. I misread the sign, so. Because you're big champ, what can I say? <laughs> the, oh, the, 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 the difference or eventually the difficulty to do a little louder yes to measure the, the, the G minus 2 of the positron yes. how, which effort should be made oh, how much effort okay once the positron is in the apparatus it's exactly like measuring an electron with uh, with the, the sign of the trapping potential reversed. And because to measure a magnetic moment, you measure a ratio of frequencies, it self-normalizes, so to speak. So the challenge is in getting a positron into the trap. So we start with a sodium-22 source. We've, we've got this working now, okay? A sodium-22 source makes high-energy positrons. We put them through a thin moderator, a, a single crystal of tungsten moderator. They go through. And at the, they, they slow down before they annihilate. And some of them at the exit surface see the work function, and it has the wrong sign for them, so it pops them out. Okay? And some of those pick up an electron as they go. So we have this high Rydberg state, which wouldn't even be held together except for our magnetic field. This really high Rydberg state comes into our trapping region. We're very careful not to apply an electric field until we get it inside of the trapping well. Then we abruptly apply an electric field, ionize it, and then we can catch either the positron or the electron in equal amounts. 
maybe that was too long of a question, but the, the, the art in this is getting it in, and, and, and then you have to worry about things like what size hole do you put in to let these positrons come in? And we started by putting a really small hole, and it was so small we couldn't get any positrons through, okay? So now we've made the hole a little bigger, which means there's some perturbations that we have to worry about, but I think we're still fine, and I, not, that, that, that's working, okay? Did that answer your question? Yeah. How many did you get? Thank you. We only need one. Just need one. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want more than one. Okay. Let, let me, a simpler one. We have all the extras. Once we have one, we're happy and we'll send them to you. So. Yeah. Simpler one, with the electrons. How do you get trapped only one? One and only one. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it turns out, well, these days my students aren't so good at it, okay, to start because we, we hold them for months at a time, so you don't get much practice. Back in the old days, I had an apparatus where I could load an electron in five seconds and know for sure it was just one. And what you do is you drive this, this, this motion between the charges hard, hard enough to induce a signal. You, know, you put it, the current through a resistor, and then you, you put some electronics on that. Okay, that's gonna be the squid in the next generation. And then you can measure how much current there is Okay, and you can see there's one unit of current or two units of current, and, 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 you know, and then we do that, we use some tricks with anharmonicity in the trap and stuff, but we get these nice steps, just like you, you know, you know one, one electron, two electrons, three electrons, and, and so, you know, you say, now, if you get too many, you can take the trap and you can gently, you know, release it. It's kind of nerve-wracking. We used to do this with antiprotons, and then you watch, and then you try and snap it back when there's only one left, okay? And you don't always succeed, but, you know, often, once you get good at it, you know, you kind of get... One of the things about being an experimenter is you have to sort of learn how to think like the apparatus does, so to speak, okay? And then you can sort of be in tune with it and get it to work. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's no ambiguity. Okay, and in fact, when I trace out a resonance line shape, the width will be twice as large if there's two electrons in there. So there's no danger that it's not just one. Okay. Out of curiosities. Let, let me replace, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, go back a few years. Um, um, no, you, you said at the beginning that uh, you didn't want to speak about um, electric uh, dipole moment of the electron, but, uh, you know, uh, um, curiosity is, uh, is uh, too much, uh, and also I think it, it is important maybe for young people, uh, for, for the future, uh, uh, you know, to understand that, uh, now there is uh, interest uh, in the uh, measurement of electric dipole moment, uh, again, of the neutron, but also the proton. Eh? And uh, so it was uh, curious to know uh, what are the prospects uh, of uh, measurements uh, for the electric dipole moment of the electron compared also to these other uh, hadronic electric dipole moments. Uh, if, you, if you were uh, a young person, where uh, would you put your bet on uh, electric dipole moments? To oh, be I, would, I would bet on both if I was young, okay? Um, because there's very different physics involved, right? In the electron, there, what we measure is either an electric dipole moment or there's a more esoteric coupling between the nucleus and the electron because the electron has to go screaming by a heavy nucleus in order to get a relativistic enhancement, okay? And there can be a direct coupling there. Um, in, in the case of the proton and the neutron, I mean, they aren't elementary particles, so there's quarks and gluons and who knows what inside of a nucleus, right? And so there's, there's, there's at least a dozen kind of different ways that people can think of, probably a lot more if you want to be you know, subtle about it, um, you know, for, for saying where would the electric dipole moment of the proton as a composite arise, okay? And so in some sense, the electron is really clean, but the proton has a broader scope you know, of, of, of interactions that you're looking for. And since we have no idea where the CP violation in our universe is hiding, both are very interesting, I think. Okay, 
I just don't have the bandwidth to work on two right now. But if I was younger, that would be different, of course, right? Then I'd have infinite bandwidth and, and you know, and, and I, I, well, I, I wouldn't realize that I didn't have infinite bandwidth. That's another way of saying it, okay? But I think they're both important, okay? And I think the prospects right now, we have an apparatus at Northwestern, the new ACME apparatus, that's just being commissioned, basically. And it's, uh, I'm very optimistic about it. On paper, we should be able to uh, improve the, our sensitivity by a factor of 40. We have twice improved by a factor of 10, and now we think we can go another factor of 10, let's say, okay? So I'm, it's kind of a nice time in, in our lab. It's kind of exciting. There's lots of good stuff going on right now, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Okay, I believe that uh, if not, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Gabriese again. Thank you, everybody.